Um, it's called an indigenous church. It's a church that's self-supporting, self-governing, and able to advertise on its own. So we thank God for our missions, we thank God for our missionaries, and we thank God for each and every one of you that support missions. If you don't, we just ask you to consider it. This is the only offering as the pastor that I take, and that is the missions offering, because I just believe it's so, so important. I believe tithes and offerings are important, but I believe that a church that only gives to itself really isn't serving much of a purpose. Amen. Some of it's got to go out. And another great thing that we do if you want to support is our food bank. Our food bank ministry feeds about 150 families every week. Six tons of food last week did we give away? Six tons of food we gave away to how many families, Ray? 134 families. So there's 134 families. These people get here at 3 o'clock in the morning uh, waiting for this food. This is not like, you know, this is good stuff. This is commodities and bread and meat and, I mean, they get a full meal. Every now and then they're able to get detergent and toothpaste and toothbrushes and various things. So this is a great ministry. And sometimes they're in need of volunteers. And, uh, like, last week we were a little bit shorthanded because we had a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of food. Sometimes we get a whole, uh, basically, a semi-load in. And we could use some extra hands. So if you ever need something to do on a Wednesday, give us a call. And we'll be glad to let you know if we have some openings. It is an incredible, incredible, incredible ministry. Well, today, um, before I preach, I want to remind you of something found in Luke chapter 2, verse 49. In Luke chapter 2, verse 49, Jesus is missing. His family is in somewhat of a panic. And he's about 12 years old at this time. And if you could imagine your 12-year-old son being lost, not knowing where he is, because see, the Jews, they traveled in packs. They weren't like us Americans that have 15 passenger vehicles and two people driving them. They, they, were, they traveled in mass. And sometimes the children would kind of pack together and play together as they were walking and traveling. Well, in the midst of all that, Jesus got what they thought was misplaced. And they went back to town hunting everywhere for them. And you, you all know where they found him, if you know the word. You know that they found him in the temple debating and reasoning with the theologians, teachers, and the religious leaders of the time. And it says they were astonished at his knowledge. And his mom. Anybody, any mom ever been looking for their child and couldn't find them and that panic begins to set in? And then when you finally see them, you have this mixture of wanting to kill them, but yet you're so happy to see them that you hug them. And, ah! uh, and I can't imagine that was what Mary was like. And here, here's what Mary said. Where did you go? We couldn't find you. Your father and I, we're looking all over the place for you. And Jesus responded with something very simple. He said, wouldn't you know I'd be about my father's business? And tonight, we have an opportunity to be about our father's business. Now, I'm going to be very honest. Our, our business meetings have been sparsely attended at best. And here's the problem with that. If you are a member of this church, you made a covenant. Amen? You made a covenant to honor God with your time, your talent, and your tithe. And you know, the easiest part of that to give is your tithe. The hardest part to give is our time, because that's the most valuable commodity we have. And I'm going to guess this business meeting tonight will last about 40 minutes. And there are some pretty big things on the agenda. Okay, one of them being we need to clean up our bylaws on the issue of biblical marriage. I'm going to ask Rick if he'll come up for a minute. And we're going to deal with, with a matter regarding the pavilion and uh, how to move forward with that. Rick, they, they, they hide the microphones on me now. It's, it's <laughs> and then uh, we're going to let you all know um, some financial updates on where we are on some different matters and what you can do to help us get over the hump. Um, we've got a few things we need to get done, but if you are a member of this church and you just don't attend business meetings because you don't care, that's scary to me. Because that means anything can happen and you have no control over what happens. So if you're a member of this church, please, 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 by all means, come to this business meeting tonight. Like I said, about 40 minutes is all it's going to take. We're not going to do the pre-service and all that. We're going to come. We're going to pray. We're going to go straight down to business. We're going to get it done. And then you all can head on. Some of us are going to go to Rafferty's afterwards if you want to hang out with us there. And the rest of you can just go back home. But anyways, uh, Rick's going to give us a little bit of an update on the pavilion. Good morning. How you doing this morning? Uh, just a little update on the pavilion. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank every, each and every one of you that have purchased bricks. 
We, we just about have that all completed now. We've, as you've seen in the foyer, there are bricks out there to look at, and this is how we're going to erect the, the fireplace with them. Uh, I don't remember, it's a couple of months ago maybe, I asked for certain people or uh, some of the congregation to make pledges, and, uh, and, and a lot of you responded. If you have not, I'd appreciate it if you would follow through, if, if you can, and help us out with that. And at the present time, I think uh, all we need is about probably what Pastor Tim. If we bricks. sold about 15 more bricks, I believe we'd be able to do phase one go completed. Ahead, go ahead and share the rest of it. Uh, we actually had a pretty sizable donation come in this week for the pavilion. We were at about 12,500. And we spent about 1000 getting the bricks purchased and getting them engraved. And then we had 8000 come in this week. Amen. Amen. Now that is enough to get us pretty close to finished. But we're still wanting to make sure we have a little bit of a cushion. And there are some of you that you said, hey, I'll buy a brick. And maybe you haven't paid for it yet. And maybe you thought that ship had sailed because we, you already saw the bricks ordered. And you may say, man, $125 for a small brick, I just, I just can't, I can't cough that up. But maybe some of you can do 10 or $15 a week until you get the brick paid for. And those bricks you can get in honor of, go ahead. Yeah, you can get, in, you can get this brick in honor of or in memory of or just your name. Whatever you want on, on the, the logo, you know, you pretty much can do what you want to with it. Right. Uh, if you've got a lost loved one that you want to put on there, uh, if you just... Whatever you want to do with it, you're welcome to do that with it. We can have them printed about any way you want to. So, and we're going to have this design. I think we're going to try to maybe do a, a maybe a floor type. But we, we're, some of that is still in the in the thinking process now because building a fireplace out in there is is kind of a unique thing, and we want to make sure it's done right. We want to make sure that it looks very presentable to the Lakeside family. So, whenever you guys, we all get to use it, and I tell you, this is going to be a super super asset to this church. I believe that. Amen. I believe this is given to me by God. Guys, help me out with it. Let's push this thing on through and let's Amen. get it done. 40 okay? by 64 pavilion is going to be extra large. And look, here, here's what we're not asking. If you've already bought a brick, then, then we're not pressuring you to get another one. Okay, but maybe there are some of you that you haven't yet. And this is just an opportunity for you and your family or someone in your family to be remembered forever because this thing is going to last God only knows how long, for generations to come. And for $125 and a small brick, you can have that put on that fireplace and everyone can, can see the name of a loved one or someone you're trying to remember, or your own name, essentially forever. And again, if we sold about 15 more, or if maybe the 10 or 15 people that said, hey, I'll take one, because we had closed the brick sales for, for a, a short period, but we've just decided... If anybody else wants to pick up one of those, this is your last shot. And uh, hopefully tonight we'll make some decisions to where we can possibly move forward with this project. I'm pretty excited about it. Yes. Amen. It's going to be a huge... Yes, sir? I'll be in the back. If anybody would like to see me in the back, give me your name and uh, what you want. And right after church, I'll be with you and you will. Amen. So some big business happening tonight. Here's the thing, folks. We've got to protect our church. Um, from the movement, this liberal agenda that's coming. And I think our bylaws need to reflect that. So if nothing else, that is, the, I believe, the most important thing we're doing tonight. And folks, we need, I believe it's 75% uh, vote in order to pass that. Now, we do not have, our bylaws do not require a quorum. So basically, if 15 of you show up, that means 15 of you make the decision. And uh, let's not make that a habit of letting 10 or 15 people make the decision. I'd like to see everyone out tonight. Again, I don't push this hard often, but this is very important. Again, this is a special business meeting. This is not our annual business meeting. This is something we called because we felt that the time was right and the need was urgent. So see you all tonight at 6 p.m. If you are not a member and you just want to see how we conduct business. Maybe you're considering membership or maybe um, you're new here and you want to see what goes on in a business meeting. You are more than welcome to come. The only thing is you have to understand you can't vote. So when we ask for a vote, you have to be quiet. And actually we'll have you a section for you so that you can sit so we can just kind of have an easy time with the vote. Most of the votes today, I believe, will be verbal votes instead of written ballots. So, in fact, I think we're only taking one actual vote. All right. Now, with all that business out of the way, 
Um, we're going to refer to our core values again real quickly. We've been preaching a core values series, some things we really value at Lakeside Worship Center, the things that kind of make us who we are and why we do what we do. And when we talk about core values, those are things that are unchanging. Values don't change. You know, methods change, systems change, but values don't change. Values stay the same. We believe, number one, the scripture as the only truth. There is no truth outside of the word of God. The second thing we believe is in prayer and worship. Folks, if we're not a people of prayer and worship, we are dead. Amen? Amen? We have got to pray. We've got to worship. Third, we believe in spirit empowerment. We are a Pentecostal church. We believe in the gifts of the spirit. We believe in discernment, tongues, interpretation, prophecy, faith, wisdom, knowledge, healing, and miracles. We believe people can get a little excited. We believe in a little shouting. We believe that God is just excited himself, so why not be excited with him? Amen? And then the fourth thing that we believe is in sharing our faith in Jesus. Folks, we need to be evangelistic. And our method here is we do not do a whole lot of outreaches. We have the food bank. We have a thing we do on October 31st. We've got a couple of things. But our method of evangelism is to equip you to reach at least five people. Every single one of you know five people at least that don't know Jesus. And we want to give you the equipment you need to reach those five people for Jesus. That is the best evangelistic program you will ever take part in is reaching your friends because you've already got a relationship with them. They already know you. They already see your walk. They already see you walking consistently with him. And then that when, you, when they talk to you, they know you mean business. If you get them to come to church, they may not know you, they may not know anything about you, and, and they walk away thinking, well, that was nice, but who are those people? But when you invite a friend, it's a whole different story. Do you realize that, I believe it's 88% of people that come to church were invited by a friend? So don't underestimate the power of your witness. And then the fifth thing we believe in is making disciples. And last week I talked about being a disciple was to be selfless, not to be selfish. And then this week, we're going to be talking about integrity. We believe in integrity. Without integrity, it's all a wash. It's all useless. There is no point if we're not going to walk in integrity. And then next week, we'll be talking about we believe in the family. And you, will, you see that exercise here today when we let our children dance around in the aisles. Where else would we want our children dancing and playing and laughing besides in church on a Sunday morning? I tell you what, I will take the distractions. Amen. I will take the noise. I will take having to go shh and all that stuff because I want my kids and your kids and every kid here to think Sunday morning is the most awesome thing ever. Amen. I want them to enjoy it. I want them to love it. I want them to dance. I want them to sweat. I want them to have fun. I want them to go to kids' church next week and all the parents are like, woohoo, thank you, Jesus. I tell you what, if nothing else, I think doing this once a month gives our parents a whole new appreciation for our kids' workers. Amen. They recognize three weeks out of the month, somebody takes care of them for me, and I have no distractions. Last thing is we believe in community. I'm going to ask Brother Blair to come up real quickly. I know I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> just in one minute or less, just tell them what we're doing next Sunday one evening. One minute or less? I can't do that. Yeah, you can. i got confidence in you. One minute or less. Next Sunday night, community group, our house. Invite somebody. Amen. Because, you know, you, a lot of times you invite people to church, but if you invite them to your home, they're more likely to come. Amen. And then you can invite them to church. Amen? Amen. Sure Amen. Enough. Yes, sir. <laughs> now, this Sunday evening is our launch. This is our first one. And we don't know what it's going to become from here. It may just stay in one home, or this thing may just blow up, and we may need host homes all over the place. And basically what it's going to be is it's going to be a time of fellowship. It's going to be a time of, of, of study the word. It's going to be a time of worship. It's going to be a time of prayer. It's just going to be a time of camaraderie where the people of God can come together in a place that isn't this building. Amen? Churches become too building focused sometimes. And church is not a building. It's people. And when people come together in the name of Jesus, no matter where the location is, amazing things can happen. I believe people are going to receive healing in community groups. Amen. I believe people are going to receive salvation in community groups. And, and Brother Donnie pointed out a, a, a really good point. Some people won't darken the door of a church, but they'll come to your house and eat supper with you. Amen. And maybe this will be a bridge between the church and the world or the church and the lost that will get them in. Because people need to get saved. People need Jesus. Are you seeing how the world's acting right now? Amen. We need Jesus. We need the church to be active in our communities. So if you are interested in community groups in any way, whether you're wanting to attend or maybe you think, I'd like to lead one, then everyone go to Brother Blair, 
in Sister Blair's house next Sunday evening. There are directions out in the foyer on the table uh, how to get there. It's very easy to find, and I believe you will be blessed. Amen. Let's, 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 let's pull in Azusa Street. Let's, let's bring so many people in their house that the, that the porch falls in. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. And she's looking at me like, you better hush, preacher. <laughs> Integrity. I'm going to go to Isaiah chapter 1, if you'll go there with me. The book of Isaiah is a barn burner. The book of Isaiah, if you're not careful, can be very discouraging. But really, when you look at the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah is a consoler. And he's really consoling and encouraging Israel to repent. Because see, when God in the beginning made man, when man fell, God called one nation unto himself. And he said, you are going to be my prize. You are going to be my people. You're going to be after my own heart. And you're going to live according to my ways. You're going to be my people. I'm going to be your God. You're going to follow my decrees. And I'm going to bless you. And that nation was called Israel, and we know that nation sinned. That nation disobeyed God. And what would happen is God would appoint godly leaders. And they would rebel against these godly leaders. And these godly leaders would uh, encourage them to repent and turn back to God. And then eventually they got tired of God choosing their leaders. This was during the period of Judges. So they said, give us a king. We want to pick our own leaders. And of course, you know the nation of Israel went haywire after that. The nation of Israel divided into two main camps. There was Judah and there was Israel. And the people of Judah were the righteous strand there for a while. Or Judah and Jerusalem, I apologize. But then they both went corrupt. And God is calling them to repentance. And we find ourselves in Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah was a prophet. To be a prophet in his day was a very dangerous thing because God's people were very rebellious. Starting with verse 1. This is the vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah the son of Amos saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens. Listen, O earth. For the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donkey his owner's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Ah, sinful nation, a people loaded with guilt, a brood of evil, evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel. They have turned their backs on him. And again, I remind you, this is not a heathen nation. This is the nation of Israel, the people that God hand-selected to be his own, the people that were supposed to be set apart and not participate in these evil things. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in your rebellion? Your whole head is injured. Your whole heart is afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness, only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with oil. Your country is desolate, desolate. your cities burned with fire. Your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you, laid waste as when overthrown by strangers. The daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a field of melons, like a city under siege. Unless the Lord, listen to this, unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom. We would have become like Gomorrah. And I tell you what, whenever we get to the place to where we feel like, you know what, I don't need the Lord. I can do this on my own. If the Lord was to leave us to ourselves, we couldn't do it. The only reason any of us are able to live and move and have our being and do anything is because of his grace and because of his mercy and because he lives within us and because he doesn't forsake his people even when we're acting stupid. Amen? Amen. It says, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me? Now I want to 
Make sure you understand, he is not talking about Sodom and Gomorrah here. He is talking to the people of Israel, comparing them to Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah was a very wicked city you can read about in Genesis chapter 19. And basically they had turned away from God so completely that they had even abandoned the natural law of marriage and abandoned the natural male to female relationship. They had turned over to full gluttony, to disrespect completely of people and leaders to the point to where they didn't even respect the angels of God. So this was a bad, bad city. And God is comparing them to these people. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I've had more than enough burnt offerings and rams of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and of goats. Now I want to stop there for just a second. Who commanded the people of Israel to do these things? To slaughter animals and sacrifice them and to bring offerings. Whose command was that? It was God's command, right? So if it was God's command, why are they so repulsive to him now? It says, I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you appear before me, who has asked this of you? This trampling of my courts. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Listen to this. It says, your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, and con convocations, I cannot bear your evil assemblies. Your new moon festivals and your appointed feast, my soul hates. And the appointed feasts and the, and the festivals he's talking about are these Jewish festivals they're taking part in. It says, they have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. And even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Now, you all may think, man, this sounds really dark, Pastor Tim. What are you doing to us this morning? Well, here is the part that everybody starts at. And this is the part that's encouraging. This is God. He says, come. Now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though, I, though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. But if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is a heavy heavy, heavy text. And really what this text is dealing with is the people of Israel were not walking in integrity. They were living one way and then they would put on their Sabbath smile and do all their regulations and their Jewish feasts because they were Jews. But there was no substance behind their ritual. There was no relationship behind their ritual. They did whatever they wanted. They lived however they wanted. They did all the things that they wanted. They were unjust. They were unfair. They were killers. They were murderers. They were doing all the things that the heathen nations would do. But on Saturday, they would come together and worship the Lord and pretend like everything was okay. And God was like, this, this, this is making me sick, folks. This is making me sick. I can't stand it anymore. So he sent a prophet by the, name, by the name of Isaiah that said, Folks, it is time for my people to walk in integrity. It is time for my people to stop just giving offerings and begin to do what those offerings represent, which is justice, which is mercy, which is sacrifice, which is holiness, which is obedience. And I wonder today, in comparison, how the church looks as compared to Israel during this time. There are three reasons I really believe in integrity. Number one, God expects no less. God will not tolerate hypocrisy. Hypocrisy and integrity are polar opposites. Let me ask you a question. Was it the religious rituals that caused Jesus to go off on the Pharisees? Does Jesus hate religion? Really, does he? What's he hate? Religious hypocrisy. People who walk in the name of religion, yet they do not honor his name. They do not honor what those religious rituals represent. See, water baptism is a beautiful thing. Right. It is a beautiful thing unless you're just not walking in integrity. You know, if you're not walking in integrity and you got baptized, you just took a dip, folks. If you take communion every month, when we share communion, and your life's not right before God, you're just eating a pretty nasty cracker and some, a little shot of uh, wine. I'm joking, it's grape juice. 
a little shot of grape juice. And that's it. Rituals without a life of integrity are meaningless. And that's where Israel was. So number one, God expects integrity. Number two, without integrity, what we do is meaningless, folks. Why do we participate in Christian stuff if we're not going to live a Christian life? Do we think we're tricking God? Do we think we trick everyone else, don't we? Everyone else sees us faithful to the house of God. Everybody else sees us doing the the right things. But behind closed doors, we're living in blatant and obvious and purposeful hypocrisy. But yet we want to participate in the things because we want God's blessing. When Jesus says, you hypocrites, in the New New Testament, the Greek word is hypocrites. And what it means is someone who participates in a play. And if you remember Greek plays, now they would use masks much larger than this one. In fact, it would cover their whole body. And if you notice, when you study Greek history and Roman history, they did not use females in plays. They only used males. And they would use masks to cover their bodies. And inside the mask, they would have these, these megaphones that would amplify their voice on the stage. And if it was a happy part, there would be a smile. The person behind the mask could be whoever. It could be a man, it could be a woman, they could be tall, they could be short, it didn't matter because they had this massive mask in front of them, amplifying their voice. It could be someone who's scared, it could be someone who's bold, it didn't matter because they had the mask in front of them and that mask covered up who they really were and the only thing the audience saw was the mask. The only thing the audience saw was what they were allowing them to see and then when they tucked behind the stage, they'd put the mask down and then everyone else saw who they really were. So when Jesus was saying, you hypocrites, that's what he was saying. You're putting on a phony mask, but whenever you take it off, you're not who you're saying you are. You're not who you're portraying yourself to be. You're not this big holy Pharisee or Sadducee. You're a hypocrite. See, we've pacified Jesus to the point to where it's only about the nice Jesus. It's only about the Jesus that was soft. Sometimes Jesus was very harsh, especially if you were a hypocrite. Now, Jesus was gentle to the sinner. He had supper with the sinner. Jesus was gentle to those who were hurting and struggling and came to him for help, but he was harsh with hypocrites. So number one, God expects it. Number two, without our, without our message and our life is meaningless. Number three, how many of y'all have noticed that integrity is a hot commodity anymore? It is difficult to find You don't hardly see it in the pulpit. You don't hardly see it in the pew. You don't see it in government. Amen? You don't see it in not-for-profits. Just recently, I think a few days ago, it was real that a man was stealing $180,000 from a not-for-profit. I can't remember which one it was. It was one that's supposed to be feeding people. And you see this over and over and over again. Why do you think the confidence of America in the church is shot? is because God's people do not value integrity like we used to. How many of y'all remember a day when your word was your bond and a handshake was all it took to get the job done? Would you do that today? No way, because integrity doesn't matter to people anymore. But folks, it has to matter to us. Integrity has to be a big deal to us. Now see, here's what I'm not saying. Integrity does not mean you're perfect. Integrity does not mean you never make mistakes. Integrity does not mean you don't sometimes mess up. But integrity means when you make a mistake, you own it. You come clean. You go before the Lord and the person you hurt, and you say, you know what? I made a mistake, and I'm sorry. You know that will earn you more than trying to hide it? Because the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. And if you get found out, it'll destroy you. Another thing about sin is the more you hide it, the more it grows, like a cancer. But at the moment you confess it, it dissipates. Forgiven, gone. Its stronghold, its power over you has vanished. Confess that thing while it's small, folks. Because it'll rob you of your integrity. Integrity does not mean I'm perfect. It just means I'm not trying to hide anything. I'm not trying to get behind a mask 
and show everybody, look, I'm this big, spiritual, disciplined person. Look at me. I'm so happy for Jesus. Look at me giving in the offering. Look at me doing all these spiritual things. When you take the mask down, there's nothing but a lying, cheating hypocrite behind it that's trying to fake everybody out, but God sees through the mask. The mask may work for man, but it doesn't work for God, and that is what God is addressing in this text. Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, or Matthew chapter 7, I'm sorry, verse 1 through 5. It says, do not, be ju- do not judge, or you too will be judged. You know, 20 years ago, the most popular verse in America was John 3.16. Today, this is the most popular verse in America because it is misunderstood. People use it as an excuse to say, you can't tell me what I'm doing is wrong. This is for in some way, for, for in the same way as you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, Jesus, in the next verse, shows us he's not dealing with pointing out wrongs. He's dealing with hypocrisy. He says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Jesus is saying, look, clean your own house before you go accuse your neighbor. Make sure you're walking in integrity first before you start casting judgment. Before you start trying to call someone out on their own sin. That's why the Bible says, be careful if you think you stand unless you fall. And that's why it says in Galatians, to, when you uh, see another person in sin, to confront them gently lest you also become tempted. Sin is tricky, folks. Amen? Satan is tricky. And the Bible says, God told Israel, if I hadn't left a remnant, every one of y'all would have lost your mind. Jesus said, if I didn't shorten the last days, even the elect would get fooled by this man people call the Antichrist. Folks, we need Jesus. We need his help in every hour. You remember that song? I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. Boy, that's a powerful song because it expresses our dire need for him. Without him in our lives, without him moving within us, there would be no hope, no chance for us to do the right thing. Whenever we get to feeling good about ourselves, I think it's because we forget how depraved we are without Jesus. We forget how lost we were before he came and rescued us. So in this text, Jesus is saying, look, nobody's perfect. Everybody's got something in their eye. Deal with your issue first. I have a feeling if all of us would take care of our own issues, we probably wouldn't have time. Say, brother, let me get that speck out of your eye. Meanwhile, you're poking him in the eye with the big plank that's in yours, trying to reach his. I'm not saying it's never proper to point out sin. There is a time to point out sin. But friends, if you're walking in it, that's not the time. If you're walking in hypocrisy and trying to hide your own issues, deal with those first. No one has it all together. The big difference between being a person of integrity and a hypocrite is a person of integrity does not put on the mask. He's not trying to fool people. The person of integrity doesn't care what people think. The person of integrity says, yeah, you know what, maybe I don't have it all together, but at least I'm at the right place. At least I'm seeking the right thing, and I'm getting better. I'm growing. I'm becoming more like Jesus. But see, the hypocrite just says, no, I'm good. Everything's good with me. I'm okay. But behind the mask, they're a mess. And they put on those Sunday smiles. And they act like everything's okay. And then there are people that come to church that are genuinely struggling. And they see the mask. And a person in the mask is just saying, hey, just give to Jesus, everything will be okay. Hallelujah. And they're worshiping, and they're doing all the great things. And oh, if you just do what I do, your life will be great like mine. And the person that's struggling is thinking, I can't do that. My life's falling apart. But see, they don't realize you're just faking. So they go home discouraged, beating themselves up. Hypocrisy is damaging, folks. 
It's damaging to the kingdom of God. It's damaging to people that are trying and seem to can't make it. And it's damaging to the people that are fooling themselves because judgment day is coming. Amen? God points out to Israel their disobedience. I'm going to read verses 1 through 8 again real quick. Actually, I'll do verses 2 through 8. Hear, O heavens, listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. So God's saying, I made an investment in you. I made a deposit in you. I've called you. I've set you apart. And yet, here, you're not listening to me. Anybody ever had children like that? You spend your whole life raising children to do what you believe God has called them to do. And you've invested, and you've poured, and you've wept, and you've prayed. And some loser comes into their life, knocks them off course, and you're like, hey! You know better than this. I raised you differently than this. You wouldn't believe how many parents I hear say that I didn't raise my child to do these things. They know better. I taught them better. I brought them to church. I did all the things I was supposed to do. And that's the cry of God. He's saying, Israel, I've done my part. He says, the ox knows his master, the donkey his owner, or its manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. All sinful nature, people loaded with guilt. A brood of evil, evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel. They have turned their backs on Him. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why should you repeat, uh, persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured, your whole heart afflicted. From the sole of your, of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness. Only wounds, welts, and sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with oil. Your country is desolate, your cities burn with fire. Your fields are being stripped by foreigners. Right before you laid waste, when overthrown by strangers, the daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a field of melons, like a city under siege. Here's the thing. Is this the way Israel was supposed to be? What were they supposed to be receiving from God? What did he promise them when he gave them the promised land? He promised them blessing. As a matter of fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 12, he says, blessings will pursue you and overtake you if you obey. But he said, if you disobey, curses will pursue you and overtake you. So see, they thought, well, maybe we can trick God. Maybe we can obey him on Saturday. And the rest of the week, we'll do whatever we want to do. And every Saturday, we'll come back and say, oh, look, God, look at these wonderful offerings we're bringing you. And don't we as Christians do the same thing? Lord, look, I'm giving my tithe check today. Look at me sitting in the front row of church taking notes. Look, Lord, aren't I dressed nice? I got up early. I was here on time today, Lord. Aren't you proud of me, God? And he's like, what about all week, son? So God is rebuking them. He's pointing out their disobedience. He's saying, you know what? You're acting like everyone else. Therefore, you're getting the reward of everyone else. Maybe some of us, the reason we don't have God's blessing in our life is because we're not walking in obedience. And you may say, no, 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 the cross covered that. What do you think these sacrifices were? They were a foreshadow and pointing to the cross. They were under the same covenant we're under. It just hadn't come yet. They were putting their faith in the same Messiah we put our faith in. So what worked for them worked for us. If they obey and receive blessing, we obey and receive blessing. If they disobey and get rebuke, we disobey and get rebuke. Grace is only applied through faith. And faith is only applied when we put it in Jesus. When we put it in Jesus, he becomes master and lord of our lives. And he calls the shots. I'm breaking this off into three segments. Starting again with verse 9. I'm going to read through verse 17. It says, Unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom. We would have become like Gomorrah. Can you imagine Israel? The nation God called his own, becoming so wicked and heinous, they became like Sodom and Gomorrah. And God's saying, you know what? If it wasn't for my goodness, that would have happened to you. Speaking to Israel. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord? I've had more, enough, more than enough burnt offerings, 
the rams or the fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs. When you come before me, who has asked this of you, this trampling of my courts? Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, convocations, I can't bear your evil assemblies. Your new moons, festivals, and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They've become a burden to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. God's so fed up with Israel's hypocrisy. Again, he compares them to Sodom and Gomorrah. The only difference between Sodom and Gomorrah and Israel at this point is they were still God's people. And he was still calling them to repentance. Excuse me for a minute. Here's the thing, folks. God is only interested in your sacrifices and your rituals and the things that you do. He's only interested in you coming to church and doing religious things if you're seeking him, if you're after him every day of the week. Again, he doesn't expect perfection. He knows you're fallen creatures, but he expects you to pursue perfection. Amen? When we pursue perfection, we may fall short, but at least we're going in the right direction all the time. See, this is not, if Jesus is your Lord and you are following him, your condition is righteous. Are you hearing me? You cannot do anything to become more righteous. You cannot do anything to become less righteous. The problem is there are some people that call Jesus Lord and they don't do what he says. Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commands. John 14, 15. If you love me, obey my commands. You can't say I love Jesus and not do what he says. That is hypocrisy. So was it the rituals God has a problem with? You think God has a problem with you coming to church? No. What God has a problem is you coming to church and you're faking. He has a problem that we come to church and all week we've been living like hell. And all week we've been doing life our own way. Yelling at the kids. Yelling at the wife. Watching things we shouldn't watch, doing things we shouldn't do. And then we pull in the church parking lot after fussing and yelling and hollering and acting like maniacs. We straighten up our suit, we throw up our mask, and we walk in and we smile. And everybody thinks, oh, look at that family. They just have it all together. If they could only see behind the mask like God does. Here's the thing. I want you to consider this. What if God was to strip away the mask right now for everyone to see? What if for a moment God took away everything we're hiding and made everything we do laid bare? How would we feel about that? Would people see us differently? And maybe some of it is just because you're genuinely struggling. But maybe some of it is because, you know what? You're doing your own thing all week. And you just show up to church because, well, I want to feel better about myself. And maybe I'll trick God into accepting me into heaven. But God cannot be fooled. The Bible says God cannot be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that, which he, also, that, which, that he will also reap. Whatever you put in your life, that's what you're going to get out of it. Just coming to church without being a living sacrifice, not living the life, it's not going to work, folks. Jesus said to the church in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, to the angel of the Lord in the church of Laodicea, these words are of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other, but because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. And the word spit means vomit. So we're trying to live in the middle. And we're trying to play tiptoe with the world and yet I still want the blessings of God. The Bible says it makes Jesus sick. Isaiah 1 says it makes God sick.
I just wonder, is there anybody here today? Maybe you make Jesus sick. How many of us today are simply going through the motions? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 23, verse 27, you hypocrites. you like whitewashed tombs. You're beautiful on the outside. But on the inside, you're full of dead man's bones. The Pharisees had everybody tricked. The Pharisees walked around with their phylacteries and their long tassels. And everybody thought, oh, they're so wonderful. They're so holy. But Jesus ripped the mask off and saw them for what they really are. And they got angry because people saw their hypocrisy. I wonder how we would react. I wonder how I would react if Jesus came in this morning and ripped away the mask. See, here's the thing. When we walk in hypocrisy, God is disgusted, the kingdom is damaged, the name of Jesus is, tar is tarnished, and it's all because his people are fake. But we don't have to be. We don't have to pretend, folks. Jesus doesn't expect us to pretend. Because see, here's the beautiful part, the next part. If we go with me, starting with verse 19, or verse, uh, verse 18. Listen to what it says. This is God speaking to hypocrites. Speaking to people who are fake. He says, come now, let us reason together. God's saying, look, I'm not trying to hurt you. I want to help you. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you're willing and obey, you will eat the best of the land. You'll walk in his promises. But if you resist and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. If I get some music, I'll finish up. See, God didn't want to destroy Israel, folks. He loved Israel. And can I give you some encouragement this morning? Even if you are walking in blatant hypocrisy, God does not want to destroy you. He wants to reason with you. He wants to talk to you. He wants to encourage you to come out from a life of hypocrisy and to walk in integrity. And he's not saying you can't ever mess up again. He's not saying you can't make mistakes. He's just saying, look, be real. Let me give you an example from the scripture and someone that was real. Can be found in Luke chapter 18, verse 9. It says, to, to some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. Jesus told this story, this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all that I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even look up to heaven. But he beat his chest and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humble. Everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. Here's the deal, folks. Jesus doesn't want you to come to him only when you have it together and when you're perfect. He wants you to come together, come to him when you've blown it. But there's only one thing Jesus asks of you. Get rid of this. Get rid of it. It doesn't help anybody. It doesn't cause anything but damage and hurt and frustration and it makes God sick. Throw away the mask. And say, God, here I am. Whatever mess it is, I give it to you. And the Bible says, you'll be the one that walks away justified. Not the one with the mask saying, look at me, God. Look at what I do. Another. 
Found in John chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. My dear children, I write this to you so that you do not sin. It is God's will that you don't sin, folks. It says, but if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. There it is again. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. So here's the question. Are you willing to walk in integrity? Are you willing to say, God, even if I'm messed up, I'm not going to be phony. I'm going to be real. If I'm struggling, I'm going to be real. If I'm not struggling, I'm going to be real. I've been reading a lot of scripture today, but one last one. I'm going to go back to Revelation chapter 3, but I'm going to read through verse 21 this time. It says, to the angel of the Lord, or the, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds. You are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, and I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing, but you don't realize you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. So they put on a mask that says, look, I got it all together. I'm good. I don't need to tell the Lord anything. I don't need to confess my sin to Him. I, I, I'm good. When the pastor gives the altar call, I'm going to stand and I'm just going to be all right. Because I'm all right. You're all right. We're all right. Even if He picks on mine, I'll hurry up and say, Lord, I'm sorry real quick. And then keep the mask up. He says, but you don't realize. You don't realize. You're wretched, pitiful, poor, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. He doesn't say run from me. He doesn't say hide from me. He doesn't say, look, I'm about to hammer you over the head. He says, come to me and buy gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and put salve on your eyes so that you can see. Listen to what Jesus says. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Folks, if the Lord is on your case, rejoice. It just means He loves you. But He gives them a command. He says, be earnest and repent. That's not a famous word in church anymore. Some will tell you repent means to simply change your mind. Folks, it is more than a changing of your mind. It is a changing of your life. It is walking in a new direction. It is saying sin is this way and I'm going this way. I'm walking away. I'm turning my back on my sin. My old life, I'm not going to do that anymore. And here is one of the more popular verses that we hear out of this. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. God is giving hypocrites an opportunity to, to sit with him on his throne. And I sign up for that. I want to strip away the mask. I want to strip away everything that I use to try and trick God and try and trick everybody else. And say, God, here I am, laid bare before you. No matter what it costs, no matter how foolish I, se I seem. So maybe today some of you are like Israel. You're just going through the motions. You want the blessings of God, but you don't obey Him. Today I urge you to repent of hypocrisy. Maybe some of you feel like you got it all together. I don't need to repent. I'm okay. I urge you to repent of foolish pride. Because none of us have it together. None of us are to the place to where we no longer need Jesus. Every one of us need this altar to cry out to God and say, God, help me one more day. God, get me through one more time. Get me through one more trial. Lord, I don't want to walk away from you. Lord, I don't want to harm your name. 
It's only through Him that you have victory. For everyone else, I urge you also to repent. None of us have achieved perfection. Surely you're still pressing toward the goal. Surely there are areas you can improve. If nothing else, we can repent on behalf of our country that is actively rejecting our God. I'm going to take a few more seconds. I, I, I just I feel the need to say this. Repentance does not mean beating yourself up and wallowing in guilt. You hear me? Repentance does not mean beating yourself up and wallowing in guilt. It simply means turning away from sin. Since every Christian still has to resist sin every day. Is there any Christian that's past sin? Sin has no impact on you anymore? Then you're in daily need of repentance. Daily. You need to say, God, today I turn away from sin. Temptation, you have no power over me today. Today, Lord, I am walking in your path. I am doing what you've called me to do. If you're beating yourself up and calling it repentance, that's condemnation, folks, and it does not belong to God's people. Romans 8, 1 through 4 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. See, Jesus finished it. He took all of our sin and all of our punishment and all of our pain and everything that we deserve was poured out upon Him. And that's why when we come to Him in faith, we can be forgiven. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. Because this would be a difficult altar call. I want to clarify this one more time. Condemnation is always of the devil. How can you know the difference between the condemnation of the devil and the conviction of the Holy Spirit encouraging you to repent? Condemnation always leads you to feeling tremendous guilt, shame, and desire to hide your sin. Conviction always leads you to repentance. Conviction always shows us our error and says, God, I turn to you. But I'm just going to ask everyone to join me for just a few moments. If you're willing. And it's for the next few moments. If we can just have a time of corporate repentance where we come to God and say, God, we're not apologizing. There's a difference between asking for forgiveness and repenting. We're saying, God, I turn away from hypocrisy. God, I walk away from all things that hold me back. The Bible says, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Jesus, we thank you, Father. And Lord, right now, I repent of any evil ways. I repent on behalf of myself, on behalf of your church, on behalf of this nation. And Lord, I ask you to empower us like never before to have victory over our sin. Help us to walk in full and complete integrity. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Can we just worship Him for a minute? Lord, I worship You because of who You are. Can you sing because of who You are? Sing it out, church. Because of who You are, I give you. Hallelujah.
Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. My understand what's being said today what's being said today is not you dirty rotten filthy people get your life together what's being said today is come let us reason together says the Lord God does not want to destroy you folks he wants to restore you he wants you to receive the good of the land he wants you to be willing and obedient and it's just one simple statement of faith that says, Jesus, I turn from my sin and I turn to you. And just do that every day. Jesus, today I turn from my sin and I turn to you. Because as long as this sin nature lives in our bodies, the potential for sin lives in us. And we must turn from it. Daily. Paul said, I die daily. Paul, Jesus said daily, take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself every day. Be a living sacrifice every day. Hallelujah. Send your right hands forward. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He cause His face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Take off the mask. Walk in integrity. No matter the price, no matter the cost. Don't be afraid to let God see you raw. Don't be afraid to let God see you as you really are because He already does. And if any of God's people condemn you or come against you, try to beat you down, it's just because they don't understand the plank is sticking out of their eye. Lord, help us to deal with our own issues. Lord, help us to clean out our own closets. Lord, help us to judge properly because we're seeing clearly. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name for every one of these people that took time to come out this morning. God, that they walk away encouraged, not feeling any condemnation. Lord, I pray the Holy Spirit's conviction and active teaching would walk with them throughout the rest of their day. Lord, that your Holy Spirit would show them areas where they can improve and show them areas where they need to submit to you further. Help them to understand as long as Jesus is their Lord, their condition is unchanged. But help us to grow. Help us to pursue perfection, God. Help us to not like Israel, put on a mask and try to pretend. Oh God, what if your people were just to be real? What if your people were just to walk in integrity and say, this is who I am. You'd take us. You would take us and you would empower us. Lord, empower us with your Holy Spirit. You've already done it. Now help us to walk in it. Help us to obey you for your glory and for your honor and for your magnificent name knowing that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord and on that day the saints will rejoice like never before thank you Jesus hug a few necks let them know you're, that you're glad they came today please don't forget members and I'm members tonight we'd love to have you at the business meeting have a great evening